thanks to the Vineyard Theater, which we're in right now. They have been so wonderful and accommodating. And last but certainly not least, our fabulous friends at Playbill. And Sarah Jane from Playbill is here tonight. <laughs> um, this is actually our third year of four-day panel events. For information on the past two years, you can, and information on the rest of the week, you can go to playbill.com backslash identity week. Uh, there's a lot of great information there, including a whole companion series about this week in particular. And we have uh, tonight's uh, was written about McCarter Theater and their relaxed performances, which is a really fascinating story. So I would recommend you check it out. A few housekeeping things before we get started. Cell phones, silence them, but please do not turn them off because we love live tweeting. I'm going to be sitting in the back doing that myself. Uh, for live tweeting, first, very important, Wi-Fi. If you need it, especially if you're in this lower half, you might need that. Yeah. Um, VT2 is the network, and Vineyard, all lowercase, is the password that you should use. Um, use hashtag Identity Week, obviously, because it's hashtag Identity Week, but also tag us, at Mr. Samuel French. And I'm proud to say because of Identity Week, we are switching our handle next week from Mr. Samuel French to Samuel French NYC. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, <laughs> also, one final note, because of tonight, and this is, uh, we're trying to do this throughout the week, people tend to go up on that second level afterwards to talk to the panelists. We want to make an, an aim to go out this way and to go into the lower lobby tonight. So if you'd like to chat with the panelists or other audience members, stick around there for a little bit before we have to close up shop. Uh, and come back for tomorrow night. We have. George C. Wolf, Larry Kramer, Joy Gresham, Dr. Wow. Shangay, a lot of fabulous people. So um, join us tomorrow and have fun. Thank you. Oh, and I'd like to introduce our moderator, Deep Tran. She is the associate editor of American Theater Magazine. And uh, she's going to take it from here. Thank you. Hi. I'm normally on the journalistic side as an invisible writer. So I'm never on stage. This is very new for me. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited for the conversation. Um, so let's get started. Uh, please bring out the panel. <laughs> and for our audiences, can each of you in in introduce yourself? Where do you want to start? Let's start with you. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Christine Bruno, and uh, I'm an actor and disability advocate at Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts. Hi, I'm Laura Kirk. I'm the Director of Audience Services at Yale Repertory Theater and the School of Drama. Hi, I'm Phil Dahlman. I'm a playwright and also manager of accessibility programs for the Theater Development Fund. And hello, I'm Alexandria Wales. I'm an actor, choreographer, director, woman of many hats, as well as advocate and activist. <laughs> to start tonight's discussion, I wanted to first talk about onstage representation. In the past few seasons, we've seen quite a number, number of high profile representations of characters with disabilities on stage on Broadway such as Deaf Wes's production of Spring Awakening and A Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And so have the four of you, have, has this increase in these representations? Has it been a, a, an anomaly in your experience? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it ebbs and flows. It comes and goes. I think that right now, I'm noticing there's more of social media, which gives a more consistent conversation. There's more of a chatter. People are aware, and they're intrigued by it, whereas in the past, we didn't have Twitter. We didn't have Facebook and so many uh, extra ways of communicating that can reach a more broad audience simultaneously. So one thing I think that I'm also representing Deaf West tonight. So from my experience, what I think was unique about Spring Awakening is that there were no deaf characters per se in the show. It was about the concept of communication and miscommunication and the levels of interaction amongst people. 
Deaf West firmly believes that you have a production with the spoken language and the signed language, and they select actors who want to work together. And that then become, became what we experienced here with Spring Awakening. I would say that, uh, I'm just going to speak for a second about the two examples you gave are two very different examples because Deaf West, Deaf West production featured deaf actors and the first ever actor who uses a wheelchair on Broadway, first ever. So for those of you that didn't know that, that's like a huge thing. And then the other example that you gave, Curious Incident, uh, while that piece uh, dealt with issues of disability. That actor was not a disabled actor, which I think is, is of central importance to what we're talking about tonight. And in uh, the 2013-14 uh, season on Broadway, there were actually seven plays on Broadway that uh, featured characters with disabilities, and not one of them was played by an actor with a disability, either as a principal or an understudy. So, so if you're asking to address your question about is it an anomaly, right now I would say yes, but I agree with Alexandria that I think there's a sea, a sea change coming because I think people, because of technology, are, are voicing their opinions more and, and their preferences more, and I think the industry is, is listening. I also think it stems from the education system um, so we're seeing younger artists with disability in mind because they were exposed to it uh, growing up, right? In a way that artists 50 years ago maybe weren't. So individuals with disabilities were in separate classrooms and separate. Now there's a much more inclusive environment in our in many educational systems. I won't speak for all of them. Um, so I know for myself growing up, I was around uh, individuals with disabilities all the time. And that led to me as a playwright having them in my mind four characters and then what's the next step is opening your mind one step further to see oh there are so many tremendous actors with disabilities to play those roles so I, it, it's a movement mm -hmm. yeah and and also with the educational aspect there's another generation of, of uh, creators and artists that are coming forward and, and looking to Broadway to be inspired and and with more of this happening now it's that's going to become a part of their work as they move forward. Christine, you brought up something really good which I wanted to um, talk more about, which is this is issue of a crip face, mm -hmm. which is the phenomenon of a non-disabled actor playing a role with a, a, of a character with a disability. Mm -hmm. And so can you speak more to why is it an issue for, for the, the community? Sure. Um, so, so the term crip face is, it's, it's more widely used than it ever has been before and I think when people started using it, I, there was a, l a little bit of a hesitation to use it because it is kind of an in, in your face term. But we, we you know, use it um, in, in, you know, sort of analogous to say black face or yellow face or brown face. So that's why it's crip face. Um, I think that um, it's so important because people with disabilities, we don't, as actors with disabilities, we so rarely get to play ourselves, let alone just the fabric of society. Get to, we so rarely get to play disabled characters, which is, which is why I brought up that statistic of the seven shows on Broadway, because it's amazing that there were seven shows on Broadway that featured characters with disabilities prominently, but super disappointing that none of those uh, shows featured actors with disabilities. So, so because, you know, there's, there's that um, feeling that people, you know, we get the pushback when we say, you know, we like the practice of, di of crip face discontinued. We get pushback, well, it's just acting. It's acting, isn't that what acting is? That we inhabit, uh, we, have, we inhabit characteristics that are not our own? Well, yes, that's true, and that is acting. But the, the fact of the matter is that as disabled people and as disabled performers, there's such a history of exclusion that until that playing field is leveled, that, that uh, excuse of it's just acting doesn't work. Yes, I uh, com concur with that. As an artist, 
Well, and I, there's always the excuse, that's our job, we're actors, that's what we're supposed to do. And I say yes, but you must realize that what you get away with, with uh, and representing the disabled body, because it's, it's, it supersedes what I can quote unquote get away with. People who look at me and go, aha, she's deaf and she has limitations. So I've got an identity branded on me, but that's not all who I am, I'm an actor because I'm interested in sharing the human experience, sharing the stories that are out there. And when someone decides for me what I can do, that, that pushback is really intense. So it's a challenge because I, I want to be considered equivalently with my hearing colleagues out there. I want to be respected. And if I'm not viewed that way, then I'm gonna have a problem. <laughs> I won't be able to offer my art, and the world will be at a loss because they haven't met the fantastic Alexandria, no, but I'm saying that it is an experience that I can bring a different perspective that otherwise they would have never had the opportunity of thinking that someone could have been brought in, or as Christine could be brought in and all she could bring, and people need to be open to it. I think that not just as performers, but as creative people in the room, I think that that's something that we've lacked. I go into an audition, and I scan the sea of faces, I look at who's behind the table, and it bothers me a bit because there's no one there who really knows the experience of living in this world in this way, and that's, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's not okay if they're not allowing me to, get, to go for an audition, but it's okay for them to make the determination of who's there. It's kind of funny. I also think it's indicative of all the other communities that, that Samuel French has been that that all these panels have been discussing this week all of these issues are probably for those of you who have been here more than just tonight are hearing the same things over and over and over again because we we all deal all of us who deal with a history of exclusion are dealing with people sort of appropriating our identities and thinking that they know better than we do what the lived experience is that we have regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our disability, and a lot of those things intersect, which we you know, haven't talked about either. And winning awards for it, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were talking backstage about um, what can be, like what can playwrights do, what can directors do to better like, no like normalize a practice of casting actors with disabilities in roles that don't require a character with a disability. And so, uh, Phil, you're a playwright, and so like what are your thoughts on just making this common? Well, I, I got a great example. Uh, Christine and I uh, interacted uh, early last fall um, because we were leading up to a reading of a play I wrote. We had a character with autism. Uh, when uh, the young woman who wanted to produce the reading came to me and we, we talked about producing this reading, the thing that I was adamant about was that that role be played by an actor with autism. Um, they didn't necessarily need to be on that part of the spectrum that I had written, but they needed to have lived part of that experience. Um, and luckily I had a very nice producer that was like, yeah, absolutely, we'll find, we'll f how do we find them? And we, we found Christine's organization. Um, but I think that's where it starts. If the artists demand, you know, the art doesn't move forward if the playwright says, no, no, I, I own this. This is, you know, I've copywritten this piece. It does not move forward if the actor does not, playing this role does not have this disability. We have too many tremendous actors out there with disabilities. I mean, I, and I know I'm in a unique position and I'm surrounded in that world, so I'm a little more in tune to it than other people. But, you know, my feed is filled with uh, Deaf West or you know John McGinty is out uh, killing the game uh, in Hunchback uh, out on uh, the West Coast right now the first Deaf Hunchback there there's just so many uh, actors with disabilities that the excuse there's there's really no room for excuses and I and I think if playwrights and again this is Phil the playwright not Phil the TDF uh, <laughs> but Phil the playwright you know we stand there and say no, no this piece has to have an actor with disability for it to be honest because isn't that what all artists want? They want honest work. So if we start from there, I think it, it, it can be pushed forward. And I'll just say, you know, in my role as disability advocate, 
it's sometimes hard to advocate for that when the writer is not committed to that or when the producer is not committed to that because if somebody in that capacity in that real capacity of leadership and decision making for that project is not committed to casting something authentically it's hard for for individuals like casting directors who are making leaps and bounds in, in terms of authentic casting and wanting to uh, fold people fold actors with disabilities into the regular rotation of people that they see for for disability specific and non disability specific roles there's only so much they can do so it does have to come from the playwrights and from the producers and the directors and until they start demanding it it's it's going to be in incremental progress or until there's there's more artistic directors such as the artistic director right. Jeff West who is committed to casting actors with disabilities in, cla in classic roles that they would not otherwise be cast in. And we have a theater like that here in New York. Yeah. New York Deaf Theater is, is here as well. And also TV TV. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Laura, you work at Yale and you were telling me about uh, the training that you do for students to help them become more aware of of these uh, these issues, can can you tell us more about that? Uh, sure. So we uh, it was started by my predecessor, and we are trying to carry it forward um, as best we can. But it's it's uh, each class of new students that come in, they go through an orientation week, and a part of their orientation week um, is meeting with all of their instructors. But also we have an accessibility awareness training. Uh, it's about an hour and a half in length. And we have guests that come in and speak to their experience. Um, so we have guests, uh, this past year we had two guests that were blind and they came in and um, spoke about their, the different ways that they experience theater going and also just everyday life. And we also had um, someone, uh, an employee of Yale University who came in to speak who is deaf and she uh, related her experience as well. And, it, and it's an incredibly powerful um, moment for the students and it really starts to get them to it's it gets them to see these people as people and part of the arts community and part of their audience and uh, we, you know we speak about customer service we speak about um, just you know facilities and the things that we're trying to do with our facilities to bring them up to standard Yale's a pretty old <laughs> university so the buildings are a challenge uh, but they do get this training their first year and then it is spread throughout their time. So as designers move forward to uh, design a set in our flexible space, they are also considering the seating and how that uh, is created and, and where, are, where is their room for everyone. What about the stages? Are they considering that in their design as well? Um, they are. I'm in, and. Uh, they are. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that everybody is, but I can't speak to that just yet. Mm -hmm. But that is that that intentionality is 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 that part of the program, or are you mostly focused on audiences? Uh, no, it's a part of the it's a part of the conversation, um, and our accessibility awareness training is speaks a little bit more towards the the patron that is attending. Um, and uh, actually, even students and faculty members now that work with us. Um, but then in the classroom, our hope is that it, it is that that conversation continues, uh, and it has. It's continued through our playwriting program. A playwright wrote uh, a role specifically for a young actress that she had met, and uh, so it is. It is starting to see itself in different areas in our program, which is exciting. How can like and how can this be? How can casting directors and directors be better aware of when they're casting to really op open it up to to actors with disabilities and to like look at their own unconscious bias about what a role entails? Um, sorry, I, I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you love people I'll, with opinions. I'll just say, well, it's just because, you know, through uh, my work at Inclusion in the Arts, we've been working very closely with the Diversity Committee of the Casting Society of America on this very thing. And they, they came to us and said, you know what? We're, we need to do better. We as, as CSA need to do better because we're not seeing talent with disabilities 
with any regularity. We're only bringing in people that we might know because we know them from some other capacity or we might have seen Alexandria in a show, so we'll specifically bring in Alexandria, but we have no sort of connection to the community. The community. So we need to do better. So uh, over the past two years, um, Inclusion in the Arts and CSA partnered and we had a huge town hall that was 100 actors and 10 casting directors and a lot of casting assistants, which is super important because those are going to be the casting directors of tomorrow, in the room asking questions of each other, realizing that we as actors have a lot of misconceptions about what casting directors do and how much they're capable, how much power they actually have. And they have a lot of misconceptions about what it is we do, what it is we need. So that was a great um, informational tool for them. And then we had an entire day of workshops where the CSA devoted, they donated their time and saw over 60 actors with disabilities in different disciplines. They conducted workshop, audition workshops and they put us on tape. And, and I'll say personally, and I know um, in my role as disability advocate, I've gone in several times uh, for nondescript roles and for disability specific roles to several different casting directors and I think that it's a direct result of their efforts. Do you find that there's um, more representation now for artists with disabilities with agents and managers or because they can really help yeah. get you in the room? And that was part of the problem. That was part of the issue was that most disabled actors don't have representation so they weren't getting in the room because obviously casting directors need to do these things quickly particularly for film and television it's so quick that they just go to their top five agents and they call them and they say give me your five people that fit this you know and so we're always left out of the mix now a few of us have representation that I think is the next step Mm -hmm. is to get the agents on board. And that's a tough thing because it's their job, right? And so they want actors who are going to work consistently that, that they can make money off of. And so it's a catch-22 because right now the industry is not allowing most actors with disabilities to work on a consistent basis where it's lucrative enough for the agent to be willing to take us on. That was a sort of long-winded yeah. <laughs> answer to your question. I mean, Phil, when you when you've casted your shows, did you meet with any hesitancy among casting directors, and did I mean, they we, have to tell we people We worked back? just through the producer, um, so mm -hmm. we didn't work directly with a casting director. So I, I don't have that experience. Um, I I will say that um, there was some hesitancy with other folks connected to the production, um, with the simple question of. Well, and, and it's ignorance of, well, if he has autism, how is he going to learn the role? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I chuckle at it, but then I realize, you know what, you don't have the same life experience I have. You don't have the same, same education I have. Um, you don't have friends with autism like I have. Uh, so uh, what seemed silly to me was actually a legitimate question. And so it, it turns into an education session. And I think if you're open to that and you're not put off by educating, in the moment rather than getting angry and getting fired up and realizing that it's ignorance and ignorance can be removed by education then 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 you attack it through that way um, that's not to say that everyone's going to turn around and and be open to it um, but in my experience as a playwright um, they have yes and um, this is interesting because when I go into an audition I can sense a, a bit of resistance and I know that I'm, I'm not just here to audition. I have to educate first before I can audition, and I only have three minutes to do it all, <laughs> and then I leave. So it's very intense. So you have to choose your battles. Which one is it going to be? At a certain point, I recognize that I can't do this and I need to educate, or do I just audition and hope for the best? And it's sticky, because I, I'm thinking about CSA. I attended one of the workshops, and my experience was unique because I had a moment of clarity, and it was interesting that the casting, direct, uh, the casting people also who gave this workshop had a similar experience. I was uh, comfortable presenting my lines in ASL. I, I could do some speaking and lip reading, but I was trying to focus to comprehend on what was being spoken by my partner. 
So the reader was looking at the script and just speaking lines, and I was already at a disadvantage, try, trying to lip read or fake what not understanding on top of what was going on in the scene. And during the workshop, uh, I was uh, on camera workshop and I asked if I could ask someone in the room who already signed fluently if they could be the reader. And then my audition was n night and day difference. It was beyond what we would have thought it would have been. And that's when they saw the difference, the comfort level. They saw more of who I am, what I have to offer as opposed to being very stilted and desperately trying to lip read. And you know, like it was a favor for them, and it was actually kind of painful the first time without somebody who was a fluent signer. So having people in the room, then you think, are they open to the idea of me coming in with my own reader? Having a reader in, we, in, uh, in with me who's comfortable expressing in my language, that's something I'm gonna, a step I might have to take and see if they're willing to accept it or not. And here, here we are together. We know that we need to consistently educate. If we have the tools, we may need to even bring our tools in with us too to help them get it, to recognize the difference of, of what is potentially out there if they actually see it. And some people, it's, it's an interesting conundrum because some actors are not comfortable educating for themselves. So Alexander and I happen to be particularly comfortable because we wear a lot of hats. And, and that's just part of the fabric of who we are. But some people, some performers with disabilities, it's, it's difficult for them because they don't know whether they're allowed to ask questions or whether they're at, uh, allowed to ask for a reasonable accommodation. Or, and, and so then that becomes a, a barrier to them doing the best work that they can do. So, and, and that, that can be hard. And so that's, I think, what the CSA is trying to do is a great thing because we're trying to come together and meet in the middle and, and realize that we don't all know everything and we both communities have a lot to learn about what the other community does. So that we are giving them what they want and then they can cast us and then that makes their job easier. <laughs> but just like watching Spring Awakening, like it made me aware of just like how much more, like the additional resonances when you put those, these kind of actors in this kind of role and to see like what the, the human body can do and what the voice can do. And so what, I guess for the for those of us who are not indoctrinated in, in into this inclusive church, like what is the value of of being more inclusive and of putting these these actors into these roles that may not have that may not have a disability in written into the character? Well, I think as an audience member, when I go to watch a show, I rarely see somebody like me up there. So it's simply that, bringing more people who are alive, who are diverse, who are like me on the stage so that I can connect to them and saying, yes, yes, I get it, I'm there. I also think audiences are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. We I'm talking about as an industry. I think we put something in front of them, they go, yes, wow. You know, look, this is amazing. Like the response to Spring Awakening. You know, by and large, the response was incredible. You know, it may not have been anything that 90% that of the audience would ever have envisioned, but you put it in front of them. If it's believable and they care about the story and the people, the audience will buy it. If it doesn't ring true, the audience won't buy it. Say something? Nope. No, I'm just <laughs> agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like, how do we better educate to let casting directors and directors and artistic directors know that this isn't like a value taken away, but a value added, and you, and it's not going to going to be like, uh, like a drain on resources. I think that they that too often people see uh, something different as a risk, uh, and and they think that that we just 
it, it is taking time to turn people's thinking around to realize that it's not a risk. We are just holding the mirror up to the audience and reflecting what is in the, you know, the people that are in the audience, again, should be the people that are reflected on stage. It's not a risk. Like you said, they're not, uh, the audience will go along for the ride. They want to. Yeah. I think it is a risk in that everything we put on the stage is a risk, right? <laughs> right. It's just well, everything, <laughs> every time we step foot on the stage, it's a risk of some kind. Whether it's a financial risk, a creative risk, you're always risking that somebody is going to say, I don't like that and I don't buy it and I'm not going to spend money on it. But I don't think it's any more of a risk than that. And uh, one of my mantras, and it, it's kind of dovetailing to what Christine says, is changing fear to curiosity. Because the fear <coughs> is the risk. And instead, if people are just saying, oh, but what if we could? It opens it up to an entire new experience, a whole new world perspective, just one little shift. And there's so much potential out there. I also think that when we see something on stage, we also have to think about what's, what's backstage too. What about the lighting designer? What's, the, what's going on? What's happening backstage? part of that experience as well. Because if we're seeing that in our collective consciousness, then it does feel more normal. And it does lead us on to produce something on the stage because the actors are the ones who are being viewed, but we're not even thinking about what has not been seen, what is happening backstage as well. So we need to be mindful of that area as well. And I think that comes from uh, you know, the theaters and organizations and educational institutions in particular having an intentional inclusionary impulse from the top down, from boards and staff and administrative and, you know, artists and designers and writers and, you know, it, it has to come from every sector of the industry. That's the only way that I think that substantive, long-lasting change is going to be able to be made. Otherwise, I think what we see sometimes is there's like, we'll just take a, a, any theater, for example. If the artistic director has a particular experience of dis disability, whether they have a disabled family member or something, and okay, so that's a big agenda item for them, is making sure disability is represented at their theater when they are the artistic director and then they leave and go somewhere else and that whole initiative dies with them. And so I think what we're trying to do is make it sustainable through playwrights, through directors, through administrative staff, through boards, because if there's people at every level saying, hey, wait a minute, disability is part of diversity too, because that's, that's the biggest thing I think that we haven't said, which is really obvious is that disability gets left out of the conversation of diversity all the time. We, we talk about race, we talk about ethnicity, we talk about gender, we talk about uh, gender identity, we talk about sexuality, and we don't talk about disability. It's like, oh yeah, that's an afterthought. No, disability is, is a culture, it is part of disability, and it actually is the only club that anybody can join at any time. So. Sorry, I didn't mean that this kind of <laughs> silence in there. <laughs> oh, thank you both for, for the really great segue to the backstage part of the conversation. I mean, do, do you think like there's something within the way that uh, we're training art artists that we're not making it conducive to, you know, potential artists with disabilities? That's a great question. Yes. <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> There's no wrong answers here. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that I can really speak to that. Uh, you know, I, I neither have a, a, a disability nor did I ex go through my artist training as a playwright with anyone that had a disability, which maybe speaks that does speak speaks to loudly to, mm -hmm. to the thing, to the subject. Um, you know, I know. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that, that, that says a lot. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I have an MFA. I, I'm very lucky. I am one of the lucky few 
that has a, an MFA in acting and directing from a you know a conservatory program, and I also have a BA in 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 acting, um, but most don't because the access to training is is really really difficult, particularly with the professional training programs in the country, but uh, particularly. Um, in my experience, uh, people with physical disabilities, immediately the onus is on us to prove how we're going to be able to get through the rigorous physical aspects of the program. I've, I interviewed with a couple of places, of, well, how are you gonna fulfill the movement requirement? Well, no, you are the educator and you are the head of this program, so we're supposed to be working. If you like what you see and you see potential in me as an artist, then we're supposed to have that conversation together. I'm not supposed to be the one to give you the answers on how to teach me. I'm coming to you and I'm gonna pay you this huge sum of money that I'm probably never gonna pay off because I'm going to school to be an actor or a designer. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm looking to you for the answers. And so often, the, the, because nobody has any answers, they look to us for the answers. And, and I find it, the more that we talk about education, and it is changing, I will say, from when I went to graduate school. But I find it really interesting that in an industry that embr supposedly embraces openness and the creative spirit and innovation, when it comes to training, it, they're very rigid, particularly when it comes to disability. So incredibly rigid. Well, we have this, and we've got the movement program, and we've got the dance, and we've got, you know, and you're deaf, and so that means you would have to have an interpreter with you all the time, and we just, you know, it's there, the, the lack of expansive thinking really uh, gets me every time. So I, if, if there was one thing I would say to feed this pipeline, it would be that that the education system, particularly in the professional training programs, of which there are many now around the country, they need to be more open and more inclusive and realize that we have a lot to offer. Do you think and I would like to uh, piggyback on that, if you don't mind. I, I think, well, from my experience, my biggest challenge with education is continuing my professional training as an mm -hmm. artist. Look, I live here in New York. How many acting classes are there? It's ridiculous. And every time I think about going to a class, then all of a sudden the issue of interpreters arise and who is going to pay the interpreters. So I'm already a starving artist, so where am I going to find the money to pay for interpreters for my training? But I value the interpreters, they're my colleagues, they work hard as well. So it's a, it's a constant balancing of these questions and I think it's very important in training programs, especially at the collegiate level, to think about having budget already planned for access so that you don't have to just figure it out in the moment, have it there when it's necessary. So then instead of saying, uh, forcing the, 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 the person with the disability to figure it out, that it could, be, then it becomes an inherent barrier to access. So have it there before move, moving forward. And Christine mentioned about being the only person in her program. I went to a program for dance and then uh, I, after I had a BFA with dance, I transitioned into becoming a performer. But I was the only deaf person in my dance department. And the first year, I, I tried it without an interpreter because I thought it would just be movement. And as we went along, I realized there was more than just that. I had become accustomed to dancing without an interpreter when I was young, but there's so much more. There was theory, pedagogy, and I was missing so much without an interpreter. So for the remainder of my training, I did have an interpreter, and it was an adjustment for the experience. And I think that it also lets everyone in the room be more aware. I never tried to hide the fact that I was deaf. I was just present as a deaf person. I was there, and I wanted to become a better performer. I wasn't trying to say, look at me, I'm a person with difference, I have the different card, I have the deaf <laughs> card, right? <laughs> I was just trying to do my job and be a student. So it, it was an interesting experience. But I see uh, that often with my peers, is that we need to have peers who want to educate themselves, want to improve themselves, but the, the mindset of the educational centers 
is the blocking for us? How are they going to provide solutions is a big question. And also the, the assumption by some educators that we're less than, that simply by the nature of the fact that we have a disability that we're not as talented. And, and that does happen a lot. And it's, 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 it's usually because the non-disabled person doesn't know how to deal with whatever issue is happening. If someone has affected speech, then they just interpret that as, oh, well, they're, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna work. We don't understand what they're saying, therefore they're less than, rather than, rather than recognizing that as, as an implicit bias, which is what it is. And that should be a, a part of the conversation when educators are being hired. I, I was I gonna do. ask before, do you think that more can be done with recruitment so that programs that do have the ability and do have the support, I work in a place that has incredible support, yes. not just in our school, at this drama school, but on the university level yes. as well. So I'm really fortunate, but I'm sure there are other programs that have the support uh, and maybe they should be doing more recruiting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. But that definitely. comes from the top down as well. You have to convince in your specific situation, you <laughs> have to convince the head of the drama school that, yeah. that you should be matriculating more students with disability into, you know. Yeah. And in every situation, that you have to start at the top. For like artisans and for backstage people, designers, do you think there's something within like the way we structure the industry with like 10 out of 12s and really rigorous hours that make it really not friendly to cer to people with certain disabilities or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that is with everybody. Like for me, because I'm so used to it and you know I came up at a time prior to ADA so like I'm just used to you know doing what we do which is we do the 10 out of 12 or we do the 15 or we do or we rehearse for 10 hours and then you go and work a third shift job but some people can't do that and I think that's part of the reasonable accommodation and so I think that a person should be judged on their skill set and then if you, if you think that person's skill set is, is worthy of whatever project you're doing, then you go, okay, we're hiring you. How can we accommodate you? And I think that's unique to each individual person, yeah. as Christine says. So I think people can uh, avoid painting disability with broad strokes, right? Uh, just attack each individual as an individual and, and approach the situation as such so you know some people can do 10 out of 12s and it's great there are plenty of actors that can hustle and, and do all that and their physical abilities allow that some can't and you adjust given the situation but you need to go into it individualizing the person not painting with broad strokes of preconceived notions right and they're already doing it my uh, my daughter performed in a play and she she was not allowed to work past a certain time right um, and that was more because of her age, but they're already doing it. So it's not any different than that. Yep. You bring up a really interesting point because something that came up at our town hall, and Alexandria might remember this, was there's a big, particularly I think, and please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, Alexandria, that it's really hard on the deaf communities especially because of the need for interpreter. There's a lot of pushback about having interpreters for auditions and interpreters for for rehearsals and, and because of the extra cost right and so interesting thing for us is the some of the deaf participants in the room were saying saying this that there's a lot of pushback and we want we need the interpreters there obviously to do our best work and one of the casting directors kind of had a light bulb moment she said wait a minute she said i cast a lot of musicals and we think nothing of hiring a pianist for the day for auditions and the pianist plays for 90 seconds then they sit around for an hour for 15 minutes until the next person comes in and then they play for 90 seconds and we think nothing of shelling that money out why, why don't we have the same why don't we afford the the same to hiring interpreters and i think that was a real light bulb moment for the csa and also for the yes. actors yeah yes 
It was. <laughs> so back in January, th th there's a, this really interesting study from the New York Cultural Department that said the diversity of people who worked in New York City non arts not-for-profits non don't match the diversity of New York City. Something like a six, like 30% people of color working in not-for-profits versus 60% in New York City, you know, metro area. And there is a, a, there is a part that said, we asked about disability, but there, the numbers were too small. We didn't include it in the study. And so we're talking about how this, this shouldn't be on stage. It should be in all areas of theater. And so is there some, way to, some ways to make the hiring process for these positions more inclusive? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, the Department of Cultural Affairs, I will say, is working on that. Yeah. Because they recognize that as a huge problem. I mean, first of all, that survey didn't even say anything about disability at first. Because they thought, well, there was no data, so we'll just leave it out. And then we all kind of said, well, wait a minute. The fact that there's no data, you need to say there's no data, and then we need to address the issue. And so I, I will say the Department of Cultural Affairs is, is actively working on that. Um, and I think institutionally, it starts, again, ground floor. So internships, who are you hiring for your internships? How do most people get into their organization or uh, build out their resume as they're in college or in grad school? It's internships. So it, it's looking at a diverse hiring pool uh, at, at the start, and then it expands. And those then the folks, anybody entering is on an even playing field. They all have the same resumes, right? As then you're just, then the disability almost becomes irrelevant and you're hiring the best person. But it's really important too to, to remember, particularly when you're talking about disability and also we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna throw in intersectionality here as well, particularly for internships because if you look at the national rate of unemployment of non-disabled people, it's 20%. The national rate of unemployment for disabled people is 71%. So internships traditionally are unpaid, right? So who's going to be able to afford to do an unpaid in internship? Let's be honest. It's going to be the non-disabled white kids, pretty much, right? And, and so I think when we think about internships, we have to think about that as well. We have to make the internships uh, attractive in a way for all of these underrepresented communities. Otherwise, it's going to be this. If we just say, okay, here are these internships, and you have to have a BA, and, and they don't pay anything, and you have to live in New York for a year, but we're not going to pay you anything, like who's going to apply for those? You know? Oh. Do we want to open up to questions or get on? Oh, talk about audiences, actually. Audiences. Yes, definitely. So, uh, Phil, you you've talked. Uh, you work at TDF, <laughs> which has a great, some great initiatives in terms of uh, for audiences on on the spectrum and for also for deaf audiences. And so, can you talk a little bit about those programs? Yeah. So, uh, TDF has a wide variety of programs. Um, uh, programs. Uh, we have our Autism Theater Initiative, which has been the program that's getting the most publicity recently. Um, that presents four autism-friendly performances a year. Um, these are complete house buyouts. Um, the entire program is geared towards families with autism. The tickets are sold to them at a discount. Um, so we take a loss, uh, a hefty loss on each performance to bring the price down to at least 50% of what the Broadway price would have been uh, to make it affordable for families on the spectrum uh, or for families affected by autism. Um, in addition, we have captioned last year, I believe it was 67 Broadway shows, uh, open captioning, uh, and that continues to expand every year. Three years ago, it was 35, uh, so it, it's growing astronomically. Um, we also have uh, programs for, uh, we call it general tap, um, but it's orchestra seating for, for folks with mobility uh, or vision or hearing loss. Uh, it seats you close to the stage, but in the orchestra. Um, and we're really delving now into, with the unfortunate demise of HAI, um, into audio description. Um, that kind of was thrown at us as they closed. Our phones lit up and they said, you do this now? Um, and, we do now. And, and we do now. Uh, and, we're, and we're really starting to ease into that and to, to figure out what that, that world is. Um, but there's so much more to do. Uh, we're always trying to launch new programs. Um, we have a, a program called Access for Young Audiences that my colleague Leah Diaz uh, is point person on, but founded by my boss Lisa Carling. Um, 
but they, uh, it's for students uh, with hearing loss and with vision loss. So it's uh, five Wednesday matinees of Broadway shows that are uh, sign interpreted and open captioned and one performance uh, that is audio described. Um, and we're trying to evolve that to the next level uh, with a partnership with New York Deaf Theater where older students in the program can be mentored by deaf artists and see that there's a career path, that is, there's potential for a career uh, through that. So, um, you know, we have a ton of programs, but they're not perfect, and we're, we're always trying to make them better um, and evolve them. You know, we just started doing school workshops with our Autism Theater wow. Initiative um, with The Lion King. Uh, we got to make some great masks with some great kids uh, with autism in Brooklyn. It was fantastic. Um, and talk about uh, the artistry of puppetry and masks with them, um, which was great. Um, so yeah, that was the, the that's the elevator pitch for TDF accessibility programs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it, it's great because it goes into what we're talking about at the be beginning of this conversation about these audiences are coming and they want to see people who look like them on stage. It's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, and they need to be able to experience it, right? So the the show has to be accessible in in some way. Um, whether it's captioning or sign interpreting or audio description or uh, whether there needs to be some technical adjustments for autism friendly um, and, and you know in New York we're, we're, we're trying we're trying but you know I, I go to access conferences I came back from uh, the Kennedy Center's lead conference this past summer and man am I jealous of what my friends in Chicago get to do you know they touch tours on every corner for uh, you know patrons with vision loss and you know, in, in London, you know, the, the relaxed performance movement, you know, not four times a year, but like four times time. a month. And it's, the, the, you know, I have a colleague, uh, Roger Adeshi, who's at Temple University, um, who, who's really pushing the sensory friendly programming movement in a lot of ways. Uh, and he said this summer, access is options. It's not, you know, what, what oftentimes access becomes is an event, mm -hmm. but that's not access. Access is having options, and we are, you know, we are striving, and we're, we're pushing, and technology is helping us get there. Um, with the idea of on request access, um, you know, in the case of like handheld captioning, uh, you know, we have the eye caption devices out there. I know there are a million people trying to create an app to do uh, on demand captioning right now, um, and you know, stuff as simple as you know, TDF. We just started providing box offices with autism friendly kits, as simple as a character guide of the show, a couple of fidgets, um, and some uh, noise canceling headphones. So if a patron shows up uh, not an autism friendly performance, or, but as their right to come to any performance, we have something there that can support them um, in some way. And just one, one final question about uh, ADA compliance and how, and, and I, experience, Christy in particular, and your experience as an audience member, like mm -hmm. how far are we from, our institutions are from uh, full compliance in your, in your experience? Uh, I guess it depends where we're talking about, you know. I mean, any, any building that was built before 1990, which sadly is the majority of theaters in New York City, um, uh, is not, you know, they're not ADA compliant. They're, they're, a lot of them are trying, you know, but normally it's like the seating is sort of compliant and then the restrooms aren't compliant. You know, um, I think everybody, people's intentions are great, but I think what happens when we, when we talk about ADA compliance and when we use the term accessibility, people think they, they just stop at that, at accessibility, at, at, at wheelchair accessible seating, at, at infrared devices, at captioning, and audio description. And it goes so far beyond that. We should be talking about the intention of in inclusion throughout, um, you know, throughout everything, on our stages, in our audiences, and basic customer service. <coughs> like I, yeah. Yeah, and, and I was going to say it's very, a lot of times it's very reactionary. So instead of, and we have brilliant designers, there are brilliant designers outside of the theatrical world, but also in the theatrical world, you, you know, maybe someone can start thinking about these old Broadway houses and 
coming up with an affordable option to replace the seating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, make make something that can so someone can choose wherever they'd like to sit in the theater and they can get to those seats. I mean, mm -hmm. there's there's got to be yeah. someone with some ideas out there. And, and, then, and credit where yeah. credits due. You know, I know at least you know the, uh, I think it was two years ago the Gershwin folded in replacing their chairs with expanding their wheelchair seating and adding yeah. T coil mm -hmm. uh, for folks who have that ability with their hearing aids. So, you know, there is there are some people thinking about it, yeah, which is great. For sure. Um, I would say though, and this seem this is gonna seem like a stupid thing to say, but know the law. I mean, at the very least, know the ADA, not just the ADA from nineteen ninety, but the but the ADA Amendments Act, which changed in two thousand ten because it expanded it expanded accessibility, particularly with respect to seating. And I can't tell you how many Broadway houses I've been to where they don't know that the law has changed. And um, I'd like to uh, mention two quick things. Related to the ADA, know the law, keep up with it, but also be transparent on your website. Yes. Because for many people, that's an issue. If they don't have good communication, how they can contact you. It has to be uh, connected on the website so we know what's happening on the web and maintain accurate accessibility information there. Secondly, there's the National Association of the Deaf that soon will be releasing a position statement about theater uh, of 400 seats or more and with the best practices for providing in improved access with sign language interpreting, captioning, and so forth. And I'm, I think that's a very exciting event that should be coming soon, Great. so keep your eye out for that. Great, uh, we have, we're at seven minutes left, so let's take some questions. Yes, this gentleman up here. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Christine and Alexandria. Um, I used to work as a marketing director for theaters, and we would do ASL performances, and multiple managing directors of those theaters would say to me, it's great because you have this built-in audience to sell tickets to, and it felt a little bit uh, skeevy. So I'm just curious about the perception within the communities as representatives for those communities. Uh, what is the perception of theater? Like, is it, is it just a thing of like, what is it? I just basically ask them what's you know, what is the actual fault based opinion of how theater is for your first theory or your respective groups and you go back to what is the conversation like? Um are you trying hard enough? Is it is it, is it respected? I mean I remember feeling like uh, when we were dealing with deaf patrons, um, they were like, Well, you should do this all the time. Right? But that just doesn't happen in certain years. So is that a resentment there? Um, his question is, what, what's, the, what's the opinion among members of, of the disability community with regards to theater and how hard it is that they're trying? Well, I'm going to let Alexander take that. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> it's a good question, a little loaded. I'll try to uh, get an answer that may not fit the entire community perspective, but I do know that often the information of a show that has interpretation is, uh, in, is advertised on, by TDF or uh, whether it comes from hands-on. We assume that every deaf person then would have access to a computer and how are they getting information? Is it just through your website alone? And also if you, how would the deaf people know if they haven't been uh, contacted through their normal communication means. So contact is, in, is part of the issue. And, the, and <laughs> when you mentioned that it's a built-in audience, I don't think that's a negative. I actually think it's kind of a positive. Like a nonprofit theater needs a subscription audience. I think it's great to be special and know that the theater is going to keep me informed of what plays are going on. I, that's just me, of course. I think it's nice. <laughs> um. Yeah, I do think there's this perception, particularly among uh, uh, when you're trying to attract deaf audiences, that if you just say, okay, we have two ASL interpreted performances for each show or whatever, right? That if you build it, they'll come without any outreach. You have to do the outreach to the community to say, we want you there. We've, this is where specifically we've designed these shows for you. 
because traditionally, and again, Alexander, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what, what we hear all the time is like, we don't go to things, I mean, we, I mean, deaf and hard of hearing patrons, we traditionally don't go to things because we assume that they're, it's not for us because nobody's reaching out to us. Unless somebody reaches out to us and says, here's this thing and we want you there, we, we, we're welcoming you in our space, they choose not to. And even then so. it's not always a guarantee that someone will want to see the play that's being interpreted. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So true. And also, when we look at scheduling, that's another factor. I'm a busy person. Yeah. I cannot be available for those two dates that you're offering. I mean, thank you for offering them, but I may not necessarily be available. And uh, not everyone is able to drop everything and yes. just go to the dates that are interpreted. It's not always the case. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, as an arts administrator, where do you think is the best place to find funding for accommodations? Like being non disabled and like going, okay, I'm going to find all these accommodations and I want to be open uh, to the suggestions of our artists and our patrons as possible. And you want to accommodate quickly and right then and there so that you open up what you're doing. Well, if I knew. <laughs> yeah. Of the question is for arts administrators, where does the funding come from? Where's the best place for it? I guess, let me reiterate, like, where's the best place to start? Yeah, to start finding it. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm going to throw a little bit of a wet blanket on this because this is a big problem. If we come up here and we say, you should be doing this, and the truth is, there is not a lot of funding designated for people to make these changes in. and sometimes they're huge structural you know changes that need to be made right so because the NEA does not provide funding for structural changes or so so I'm not gonna lie to you I'm gonna say if someone just asked me this question exactly this question yesterday and I'm gonna say to you what I said to her that there's not a lot of funding out there for this kind of support but there are things you can do now that don't cost a lot of money like you can make your website accessible do, do, how many of you in this room know whether your website is 508 compliant, right? You can make the accessibility tools on your website, the, the signage and everything you can put, all that information that Alexandria was talking about front and center on your website so we don't have to dig 17 pages in to find out what, what you do offer. Um, I think the biggest thing is customer service. Um, which doesn't cost anything. You can educate your front of house staff and say when somebody calls, have the answer to the question. If someone says, I'm blind and I need assistance with a ticket, um, get, have, don't say, hold on a minute, I'll find somebody for you to talk to. Everybody at every level should know exactly the person to go to. And if they don't know the person, they should say, they, they say I'm going to find that information for you, whether it's referring them to TDF or whether you have your in-house person, you, everybody who answers yeah, that listen, phone Ticket should Master know. Ticketmaster has my phone number on their website, so just yeah. tell a charge, feel free to put it on yours. Okay. Um, but no, I, I think with, with that, you know, there are many organizations that will do training, sensitivity mm -hmm. training, disability mm -hmm. etiquette, things like that, uh, mostly for free. Um, and if you're looking for the audience uh, perspective, uh, shameless plug, TDF has a national open captioning initiative where we pay for your first two years of captioning while you develop an audience. Uh, we also have the same thing for uh, autism friendly performances. That's awesome. So if you head to our website and head to the accessibility section, you can find them. And, inclu and Inclusion in the Arts does many patron services training. So we'll, we can come in and talk to your front of house staff about the best way to to you know, uh, deal with the customers that are coming in, whether or not they have disabilities, it's just good customer service. And it needs to be ongoing. It can't yeah. just be one conversation and then you feel like you've, you're finished. <laughs> it needs yeah. to just be an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, that's refreshed every every few months, as often as it needs to be, so people feel confident to serve all the patrons. 
Oh, I don't mean to plug the place that I work for, but I work <laughs> for a, an organization called Theater, Theater Communications Group, and we offer grants for called Audience Revolution where you can actually apply for initiatives like what you're talking about. We just gave money to six theaters to, to fund more autism-friendly performances. Question? Yes. Well, so the oh. dynamic is a little different. Oh, I have to tell. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The question is, is the UK better than America in terms of being friendly? <laughs> Listen, my, my, British girl, my British girlfriend would agree. Uh, but uh, the dynamic is different uh, in that most theater and arts in the UK receives government funding. So they are required to do certain things as opposed to the commercial aspects here where the requirements are a little bit different and the government can't really knock on their door and be like, hey man, you gotta do this. Uh, where over there, uh, they, they can. Yeah, the, it is a big difference. I'll speak to my own experience as an artist. I work, I, I've worked more in the UK than I have here, which it, I say that only because that's indicative of what we've been talking about is my, my skills are, are much more embraced over there because of the culture, because over there they follow the social model of disability, which I won't get into, but there's a difference between the social model of disability and the medical model of disability. Basically, in this country, we're still sort of following the medical model, which means that I have a problem and the onus is on me to fix it. In the UK, the onus is on the society to make the society inclusive for everybody. And that's, that's really, I just threw that out there and I know that's like a huge brain exploding concept, but, but that's basically the, the difference. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, uh, you've talked about autism um, and I'm curious as to, as an artist with a mental illness, um, how you feel like mental illness and some of the more invisible disabilities fit into the conversation. How do invisible dis disabilities fit into the conversation? Such as mental illness. Such as mental illness, yeah. Well, it's removing the preconceived notion that every disability is visible. That's step one, right? Um, you know, I, I've been, uh, we've been at autism friendly performances and I've heard a, a volunteer say, well, uh, you know, what are they doing here? They don't look like they have autism. And, you know, I pull them to a side and say, let's talk about that real quick. Um, but, you know, it, it is. It's, it's, it's just, un you know, understanding that you're not going to be able to see it up front. Um, accommodations wise, I, I, you know, I, without prompting then, though, I'm not going to have it ready unless uh, it's already part of the institution, that it's something there. But if it's something beyond what the institution already has, um, it, I mean, you're right, it's the indicative of the, the medical versus the social model. Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately, I think it's, it, it's still, with people with invisible disabilities, it's kind of incumbent upon the, the person to, to speak up and say what they need, which it shouldn't be that way. And I don't have the answer, but that, that's sort of what we see, is that it, it's still, the onus is still more on you than it should be. And speaking, I mean, also from the accessibility standpoint for um, artists, because, you know, someone who went through an MFA program and the uh, sort of boot camp army model of no sleep, no, you know, Red Bull all the time, uh, I feel like that's present in the arts too, and it doesn't really, um, it's not very inclusive of people who are trying to make an active effort to take care of their mental health. Are there any more questions? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank and thank you all for coming and thank you to our wonderful thank panel. You everyone. Thank you.